the project was the refurbishment that was the visitors clubhouse that was its title um, it was opened in 95 at the stage we decided to refurbish it was very dated it was dark finishes inside um, it had um, some administration spaces we no longer used and it became um, no longer fit for our needs as a modern club, really. They could no longer attract business to it because it was a bit sad and tired and Scottish tour operators and other tour operators said, well, we can't, we can't promote this club um, as a visitor's attraction. So it was a good opportunity for a project. It wasn't efficient for us as a club and didn't allow our staff uh, to develop and, and develop themselves. It was not great morale. From a design point of view, we wanted to create something exciting. Um, and a lot of the, the existing fabric of the building allowed us to do that. There were there were strong features that, that weren't working well for the building. The, the building itself, as the approach to the building, um, there were great planters and visitors to the club couldn't move freely. There was no clear uh, indication of where entrance should be or, or, or how the club should operate. We, we wanted to try and create a building that was 360 degrees and it didn't have bins at the back door. There were great big overhanging eaves to the to the building that prevented light coming in. So we formed a terrace, pushing the glass out to the outer line of the roofs and, and people could spill out and sit in the evening. If you didn't look at the golf course out the windows, it functions very well for an evening dinner. We've got a fantastic panoramic view. Yeah, it's very special. There was a a horrible courtyard in the middle that that was a, was not was a space that everything revolved around but wasn't used properly the doors were taken away the floor was brought up to the level there's this lovely big glass roof light in the in the middle space now and it just flows through the whole space now and that that was another structural alteration that the existing fabric allowed us to to change Spatially, well, we had the office accommodation that we didn't need. We had a reception that we didn't need. We wanted an open structure, and particularly the bar previously was a small, a small bar, you know, with a big column in the middle of it and a hatch, and it really did not respond to what the club wanted to do. So we managed, it was always our aim to get rid of the, the support. The engineer had to be clever about how to transfer the load back to another point, but we managed it. We ended up suspending steel uh, on, on another piece of structure. Um, so that was that all worked so that it was open and welcoming and much bigger, and we did that. So interestingly, and like any design exercise, when there, are, when, there are, when there clearly are things that you need to do, it really helps um, point you in the direction of, of what the solutions are. Early on, um, the club engaged with the m and &E engineer, the, the mechanical electrical engineer services to, to do a utility review and a carbon assessment of, of various options with um, sustainable sources of energy. We worked out the cost effectiveness of these things. Where there was viability was increasing the thermal performance of the building envelope, which we did with the outer walls and with the, the windows and the doors. The club were keen to provide um, electric charging for for vehicles. Um, well, it was a high spec project, so the the materials um, would be low maintenance, both external and internal. And we added in um, low energy lighting into all those areas, so it's a hundred percent low energy products throughout the building, which is um, obviously a beneficial to us in our ongoing costs. But the electrical equipment allows us to assess each zone of the building so we can monitor what costs we have. But that extended also to the heating and ventilating system. The whole new um, m and &E system that was provided uh, ensured a sustainable approach going forward. And on one side where our short game practice area is, we have a, um, a living wall which is it, was, it is an exposed site, so it can be subject to very, very cold winds, and it's performed excellently. And that was a, that was a, a um, caring consideration of the club too, because there's a neighbouring house there, and they wanted to improve the um, outlook for the for the neighbours too. So each of the objectives we have, we've ticked them off, and they've been very successful. We as, we achieved 55 diners, we achieved open space, we achieved a professional shop. 
we achieved an open bar. Um, we've brought in people that not only are playing golf, we've brought our members back. People play golf, go away and come back in a different set of clothes and enjoy the space again for another three hours. It's just beneficial to the business, beneficial to the club. It's a great atmosphere. The church hall was built in 1937 onto a Victorian church built in 1860 something. And the link block had a most convoluted connection to the church itself. It's through an old window opening. It was really so constrained and such a, almost a hidden connection before. You had to really know your way through from the church to the hall. And that staircase used to go up and then go down again. It was much more convoluted than it need be. It was only 620 wide or something like that. The conclusion we, we all came to was that we could be a mo more bold about it. We could do away with the staircase going up before it went down. It could go level and down, making that more disabled friendly. And we could open up the Gothic window into a proper Gothic arch and put a decent door in it. And then have something beyond that arch, which was also attractive. So you know, there was a good flow uh, going through uh, to the church hall. And then there were things like toilets and there was a lift and there was upgrading the kitchen and so on and so on to make it all, to make it all more, more usable. It was a pretty straightforward design. Once we had fixed uh, the lift, uh, the lift was key and the disabled toilet. The link building connecting the 30s hall to the Victorian church, we, we tried to combine some elements of both into the link. So the stone arch that connects the two is very much of the narthex. Big oak doors have got fantastic uh, metalwork on them, ironwork, especially made, uh, making a cross over the junction of, of the two doors. You know, the, and the tiling in the narthex, which you know wasn't there at all, was sort of put together with great care. So it all, everything looks as if it's always been there and it's sort of seamless. The front elevation all has critter windows, the new critter windows, double glazed. Uh, the entrance door is critter. Um, but the aesthetics of the link do connect with the main church. In fact, we had uh, previously worked for the church uh, in a major redecoration and lighting project on, on the main church. It transformed the church into a church that really is fantastically beautiful. We took the same approach with the um, decoration in the link. So that it's equally bold, so you feel it all belongs. I mean, the decoration is quite striking. It's a, a daisy chain, which of course refers to uh, St. Peter's chain. We didn't want to have uh, a hostile looking chain, we wanted a friendly looking chain. Uh, and the lights, in fact, the 1950s lights by George Nelson, who's an American architect, they provide you know, a really quite a theatrical uh, element to the stair. And, and the stair is the sort of stair that you actually enjoy going up or down. There's even a nice little sort of landing at the top. There's a nice handrail that flows properly. It's all good to the touch. Yes, Ben spent time with the blacksmith to make sure that the sweep of the handrail was just right as you, so your hand naturally sort of follows it as it goes around the corner. Yeah, a lot of effort was spent with all the various trades and suppliers to get them to really buy into this job. Even the toilets, you know, that was a big deal for, again, for the congregation because there were no direct toilets from the church. You had to go downstairs and um, there was only a handful, I think there were two toilets, hardly a disabled toilet to speak of. And now they have six sit down toilets, two urinals, two accessible toilets. It's it's made a big difference to hosting events there and so on. And uh, Actually, we had very good uh, M&E engineers involved, Anne Fulner. So very detailed consideration was given to all the various different aspects um, of uh, energy saving, energy use. Um, so some really quite sophisticated uh, kit uh, in there. I mean, it's an existing building, so there's a limit to how far uh, you can go. We did strip it right back, back to basics, back to the skeleton. The roof is obviously where you lose most of the heat and that's high, a highly insulated roof. There's a whole new heating system gone in. 
much more efficient boilers, but they work for the church as well as the hall. The first thing in sustainability is to consider embodied energy. So just mm -hmm. by reusing the building, you've got a head start. For the period of COVID, it's been occupied by an organisation that looks after people who are profoundly disabled. And they actually have, have they've loved it. They, um, they can go up and down in the lift to this, to this upper room, which was always really difficult to get to previously. This is one of the most accessible buildings in Edinburgh now of its kind. And, you know, they, it has a, a really lovely feel about it. As a, as a community resource during the week, it has proved to be really appreciated. It was, it was all, that was all that was needed, just this one trick, this one move to make it all possible. The job was to design and build a school for 1,200 pupils. It was to replace an existing school which had been there for almost 50 years. And the plan was to build the new school in the grounds of the existing school. What the authority were looking for was something that would enable um, uh, learning to take place in a different way from the way it had been, in the, been possible to in the old building. Um, the second thing was that, we, of course, we were looking for a building that would service the community in a far more appropriate way than the old building had done. The community approach was hugely important um, in, in terms of its design. And the third thing, of course, was the fact that the old building was a very expensive building to run, um, both in terms of uh, light and power, heating, um, it was, it was a, and maintenance, enormously expensive compared to what, was, uh, what has been created um, under this, this new building. It was a hugely collaborative um, process, a huge amount of engagement sessions, surveys, workshops from the outset. The initial concepts that eventually came out from those early discussions of, in terms of what the school wanted was in terms of focusing on a, a faculty type model. We're on the boundary of a conservation area. It's a semi, semi rural site, a lot of established trees. The, the faculty approach it brought that overall mass down and, and did sit within the site far more appropriately. It's not quite often you, you see this level of timber used externally on, on a school building. So there was a lot of dialogue in terms of the detailing and the contractor put a huge amount of effort in getting sort of the fixing depth, the spacings, because essentially that was what was wrapping the majority of the building. We were very keen that active learning, that cooperative learning, could actually take place and we needed those spaces to be flexible so that we could make greater use of them so that every faculty in the building had a series of um, cooperative spaces collaborative spaces as well as their own classroom spaces and that's where the, the faculty model um, came to the fore so essentially we have classrooms wrapping around various types and sizes and configurations of, of, of central learning areas. And as, as Alex says, those spaces can be broken down into very informal learning or, or, or more formal learning, depending on, on, on the setting. Those varied between each of the faculties as well. And so they could do their own things, but, but that in itself created a very interesting configuration of spaces between those faculties interconnected by, by, by the main dining atrium space which eradicates long lengths of corridor and unusable space, which is quite quite unique for, for a school. It's open, it's airy, it's light. There's a series of destinations, a series of faculties interconnected by bridges between each of the faculty areas that cut across the main full height atrium area. Those breakout spaces work because of the way they're furnished and the furniture was part of the, the early design process. And that early design process came about with a, a huge amount of input from the staff in the departments and the faculties. There's enhanced U values, there's the material choices, there's were Brian very good, but the, the project was benefited from some funding from SFT. The funding allowed us to, to review the processes and workflow to then inform how we could uh, enhance the building performance. So what the the team within the design team developed uh some uh, i guess it's well programs and um, that they basically talked between the environmental and the architectural model which basically spoke to each other much more 
sensibly than previous you would see normally on a project where essentially you take the, more, the, the architectural model and it, and it directly informs the environmental modeling. It allowed us to really review and understand the performance of the building and then look at how we could implement strategies to, in, to enhance the environmental performance of the building. So out of that, there was enhanced current walling strategy, recently included to the south elevations. The way in which the windows in the south were designed, the time and the effort and the technology that went into deciding how big each of these windows was supposed to be, so that it became the most efficient way of heating the building, of making sure that the building didn't overheat, of ventilating the building so that make sure we could get some fresh air, all of these things which are important to teachers and that pupils will be able to learn in and be much more comfortable. NVHR units in terms of minimising car carbon consumption, enhancement to the BMS system to properly allow the data to be interrogated post-occupancy to, to ensure that what we've designed is actually being delivered. So the local community kind of did create a bit of um, enthusiasm to, to try and enhance the, the community aspect of, of the building, which which was actually which was taken on board. So the so the sports block and where a lot of the community um, facilities were were housed was was extended to support a, a larger swimming pool and and, and other other bits and pieces. Uh, it, it's to me, it's just one of the most successful and unique schools that I've uh, had the privilege to see.